Thanks for joining us today in the StoryCraft Cafe. We have an amazing show for you today. Uh, my friends, Jamie Castle and Rhett Bruno, join us today. Jamie, you might know as Steve Bowyer, um, you know, pen names, um, and the inimitable Roger Clark, who narrates uh, Jamie and Rhett's new book, Cold as Hell, the Black Badge series, book one. Uh, we're here to talk all about audiobooks and uh, that end of publishing, and I think we're going to have a, a fantastic conversation today. So welcome, Jamie, Rhett, and Roger. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, so uh, let, let's get started with a, uh, with a fun question. Um, Jamie, we'll start with you since in our little square format, you're, at the, you're next to me here. Um, what is a piece of writing advice that someone uh, has given you that has stuck with you? Maybe it's good advice. Maybe it's horrifically bad. Uh, something that just sticks out in your mind that, that someone has given you that, that you look back on frequently. I think, um, I think you and I have talked about this one before and I feel like I could, I could give you like a hundred examples of <laughs> really bad advice that I've gotten over the years. <laughs> um, it changes with the tides, right? Yeah. Like, there used to be the advice, write a short book. Then there was the advice, write a long book. Then there was take a long book and make it into three short books. And it was like, yeah. it was like constant. Nobody knew what you were supposed to do to do the job. But I think, I think one of the worst pieces of advice that I've ever received as a writer was don't worry about your first draft, just vomit it out. And <laughs> although that might work for some people, what that does for most people is discourages them when they go back and look over it and realize what a piece of crap they just wrote. <laughs> right. it's like impossible to fix because you didn't have a, a, a plan or anything in mind. And, and I did that for a while. I did that for 20 years when I was trying to finish my first book. And ultimately, I, I finished my first book because I learned that you can't just vomit out words because then you end up with vomit on paper. Well, and I remember 10 or 12 years ago when, when the indie revolution was really kicking up and people were, were talking about just write a book and get it out as fast as you can and then publish it. And then, you know, stuff like that gets over to, to someone like Roger and he's like, who wrote this piece of crap? This is, <laughs> this is atrocious. <laughs> what about you, Red? Is there a piece of advice that sticks out to you? Good, bad, or, or both? Um, trying to, I, I think, think the biggest thing is always like long series sell. And people take that the wrong way. Yeah, like long series are great when they're already selling, but mm. as Ethan books, I can't tell you how many people sent a submission. Like I have a twelve book arc plan. I'm like, all right, but <laughs> what if the first three don't sell? Yeah, and people wind up writing these like twelve book epics that are just not even being read by anybody past past book one. Um, so that's something we always turn that advice around like do three books and leave an opening <laughs> to, yeah. do, to do more but like you need ending points otherwise you get stuck writing forever for nobody right. um, can i also add Rhett, that when you say leave an opening they take that as don't finish the trilogy yeah, yeah no, like, so then we get to book three and they're like okay now can we do book four because the story doesn't <laughs> end and you're like oh, wait what well, and then we're like, why didn't our editors tell us that the story didn't? End? <laughs> yeah. Because they don't know, right? Like they might, they're like, oh, I guess there'll be a book four, but like mm. they don't know the details of the contract. So it's, it's, sometimes you just really have to be honest and talk with the author and be like, look, like it needs to end. Keep a subplot open or have an idea for how you could bring it back. But right. Like if you don't leave yourself out points, you're either going to piss off what few readers are there or exhaust yourself writing something for nobody. I got eight more books. Eight more books. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard uh, Jim Butcher talk about uh, that conversation he had with a writing teacher where he was, you know, telling her these ideas and she said, okay, now go, go write an outline. And he comes back with a 25 book outline. And she was like, no, I just, I just meant, this book just just get to an, <laughs> to an end point here you know yeah i, I feel that yeah jim, uh, jim got lucky right i mean yeah 
Yeah. Great. I mean, it worked out for yeah, him. Those are amazing. Know. But yeah. like, yeah. there are a lot of books that don't sell. No. And he was lucky enough to, be able to put out 17.5 of them already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think he's, I think he's going to be okay. Uh, Roger, what about you? Has there been anyone uh, that has offered advice to you in, in the work that you do in, in acting, voice acting, narrating um, that, that has, that's been really good or really bad? Ah, well, you know, really good advice uh, in my field is not to take things personally, even when it's personal, you know? Mm. Uh, and if you if you sling enough, shall we say, feces to the wall, something will eventually <laughs> stick. Uh, I always believe that work begets work, and I think that's true for a lot of artists, yeah. at least ones that are easy enough to work with. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, work begets work is is uh, yeah that that en enough is not given to you know we we like to think of writing and and. Uh, as this sort of ethereal thing that the the angels come down and, and bless you with an idea. And sometimes that happens. And and sometimes you just have to put your butt in the chair and, and get to work every day. And, and Yeah, and I, I saw a great quote from Taika Waititi recently. And he said, you know, sometimes it's just sitting in front of a computer screen and just staring at it for a couple of hours. Right. That's, that's right. Still writing. It's still writing. It's, yeah, still right. writing. it's still valid, you know, <laughs> and we've, and all writers go through that, you know? Yeah. I told my wife recently that, uh, you know, she said something like, cause I'm, I'm finishing up like my 21st book in like the last three or four years. And she's like, I don't understand how you keep writing things. And of course I have co-writers. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are, you know, mixed into that, but I'm like, sometimes my muse is the mortgage payment. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> 100 percent. i don't need a muse i need to know that i can pay bills and right. you just do the job yeah so the muse is a dirty capitalist yes yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my kids need to eat food imagine yeah. that yeah. <laughs> great artistic incentive yeah. yeah roger there there are probably uh, a number of people listening that recognize your voice uh but maybe don't recognize roger clark as being attached to that um, you are, uh, you have been thrust, uh, into pop culture over the last several years from this, this video game, uh, that you, uh, characterized the, the main character for how, how did you get involved with the Red Dead Redemption, uh, series? Well, I, I, uh, I had been, I worked in gaming for Maybe my first gaming job was maybe about 16, 17 years ago. Okay. Um, and I trained in Britain, and I was pretty good at uh, regional accents. So, you know, my, I started out in theater, but it quickly came into voice work uh, because I, I had a bit of a command over some dialects. And that led to, to voice acting and video games and then eventually performance capture, too. And I auditioned. I auditioned like uh, any other job. But of course, the video game industry is so secretive. I didn't know what I was auditioning for. They're all called untitled video game project when you walk into the door. <laughs> all I know is that they wanted me to wear cowboy boots and that they wanted some sort of like a West Texan accent. So uh, I, I really enjoyed performance capture. I think it's a fascinating medium, that and voice acting. So I, was, I, I, I ran into the place. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, eventually I found out that uh, I was going to be the protagonist of Red Dead Redemption 2. And uh, I worked on that five years. Wow. wow. That project took. And it was we a We know we waited for it. It was Jeez a gift. Liz. Jeez it was Liz. The, the longest contract I've ever had, and it was a real joy. A real so, joy working with the, all the people of Rockstar Games. And I've been able to supplement that with, with narrating audiobooks as well. I've been doing audiobooks since I was a child. My dad used to do newspaper for the blind. We would record it onto six cassettes at a time. We would do the Star Ledger from New Jersey. I'd help him cut out the little articles and whatnot. And that then when we so moved cool. to Ireland when I was a kid, uh, he brought it with him and he started it up with the local newspaper there, the Sligo Champion. Wow. So I've been I'm doing it for a long time. I, I love it. I love it. I love it very much. You mentioned um, that the Red Dead Redemption role um, that you had was was motion capture, and I think a lot of people assume because they don't know any different that that the voices they hear in video games come from a guy standing in a booth, and you just have 
pages and pages of dialogue that you're going to read that will be plugged into the game depending on what choices that you that you make and that that maybe you don't have any idea what the story is um you're just reading different pieces of dialogue that may or may not pop up in the game but that's not exactly how that works is it a lot of the industry is still voice acting uh, and I don't know, if, and I don't think it's ever going to go away. But a great majority of it now is performance capture, and performance capture really isn't that dissimilar to film or TV. The only difference being is uh, we would work with on sets, uh, and we would have, but we wouldn't have costumes. We would be wearing spandex with shiny balls on it. <laughs> so and, just uh, just like Red on a on a random Thursday, exactly. <laughs> shiny balls, exactly. yeah, yeah. With spandex. But yeah. it's. And, and then one of the other differences too is that you know the camera can be anywhere, and uh, and in, indeed you can change you can change where the camera is in post whilst you're editing. It's an amazing medium that grants you a, as the performer a lot of freedoms, and it grants the filmmaker and the and the storyteller a lot of freedom too. Yeah, and of course, yeah, everybody says voice acting because that is what it used to be, and it used to yeah. be one hundred percent that. But now it's it's kind of fifty. It it depends from studio to studio, but performance capture is a huge part of gaming now, and we're and it's a huge part of cinema too. I mean, we're going to see Avatar two when it comes out later this year. That's the exact same way I worked on Red Dead two. Wow, wow. So Jamie and Rhett, um, the Black Badge series. Uh, Jamie, you and I have had numerous conversations about our shared love of the Dresden Files, and, and we mentioned Jim Butcher earlier. And, you know, that's a series that I have absolutely loved for years and years, and I know you have too. Um, how did how did this come about, this, this project? You know, when it has a bit of a Dresden Files feel to it in that there's uh, earthbound heroes with connections to to other things, kind of the ethereal. Um, but it's uh, it very quickly establishes itself as its its very own property that, that's not just a Dresden Files ripoff um, with a cowboy. It's, it, that's not it. it. It it has a feel of that, but that's not it. Um, where, did, where did this idea come from? Well, James and Harry are very different people very, very different people. Um, I'm on my third or fourth listen through of the Dresden Files right now. I'm on book 12 changes. And um, I remember I was listening to the Dresden Files while um, I had lost my job. Things had been chaos in my life. Yeah. I'd been listening to the Dresden Files and uh, I'm in my, my hot ass garage in Texas writing because that's where I had to set up my office because I have kids. And so like I'm in my office and this, this character uh, sort of just kept talking to me. James Crowley kept talking to me. I didn't know his name yet. As a matter of fact, James Crowley is um, is a, a highway sign here in Texas. There's James Avenue and Crowley Road. And I kept driving by it, seeing James Crowley, James Crowley. I'm like, that's his name. Um, and I just wrote, I wrote nonsense. I wrote 10,000 words of nonsense in a day. It was just James Crowley walking into this town called Dead Acre. And I had this in my head, this sort of background character where he was the angel of death reincarnated. And, um, you know, I went to Rhett and of course we have, uh, Athon published one of the most successful weird Westerns of all time, a book called Make Me No Grave by Haley Stone, which was an amazing, amazing book. Phenomenal uh, book. And I had just finished editing that. Um, so anyway, I'm writing this character and I went to Rhett and I'm like, hey, I've got this idea. And he's like, it's a weird Western. What do you want to do with it? Come on. I mean, just just write it. Just have fun with it. So I wrote some stuff. And then um, at some point, Audible Originals messaged us. We had done something with them previously. And they said, hey, do you have any short fiction that you'd like to put on our platform? They were just starting the Plus platform. So nice. Like like, we, like, we were secretly told about it and they wanted us to see if we had anything short to try on it. So Dead Acre was like nothing at the time. It was 10,000 nonsensical words. There was no story. There was no plot. And um, it was just it. And Rhett read it and he's like, listen, this character is great. The voice is great. The sort of the Western cliche, if we could say it, because like mm -hmm. if you've read Dead Acre or Cold as Hell, it's it's Western. It's cliche Western done with a spin. And sometimes we get reviews that are like, it was very cliche. Well, no, no shit. That was the purpose. Like we right. wanted to give people who love Westerns what they love. And, and so Rhett 
said, okay, but there's no story. So we messaged uh, Audible Originals back. We gave them maybe like 5,000 words that Rhett and I had crafted. I think so. And they said, yeah, we love it. Let's let's finish it. So then Rhett and I powwowed. I, I don't think we're allowed to say powwowed anymore. <laughs> so, well, we, we were going to do, what, like a 10,000 word thing. They said, yeah, anything between like 10,000 and 20 <laughs> words. And as we planned it out, it became 30,000 words, which is like really long for a novella. Um, but, you know, they didn't care. They just weren't going to pay us more than, but we didn't care because we wanted to make it something cool. Um, so that was how we started building out the lore, how the black badges work, the angels and all the different relationships. Um, and the main thing we set out to was not just to do a weird Western where it's like, it's a Western and there's some magic, right? Like we wanted the magic to be integral to, to this world. Yeah. A big part of it instead of just some side thing that makes it not fully a Western. Yeah. Can, can we take a sidebar for just a second? Yeah. We, you talked about cliches. W what's the difference in a cliche and um, the idea of writing to market or writing what you are, or just understanding what your audience is looking for? Because, you know, one, one thing we know in, in indie publishing now or, or small press publishing, whatever, is that you need to identify your market and write what you know that market will buy. Because if you're writing things that, that you think are cool, but there's no audience out there for it, you can be an artist all day long. But if no one wants to buy it, then then this is just a passion project for you. Um, how do you identify cliches? Or, or and maybe it's just a, 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 a vernacular dispute. Trope, you know? yeah. trope could be trope, the word. Trope, yeah. thank you. I couldn't grab yeah, I mean, the word it, trope for some reason. I don't think there is a market for, for this. Like That's why when we said at the start, like, oh, let's do a weird Western. I was like, all right, let's do something short and, and see what happens. Like We didn't expect that acre to explode like it did because there's no market to write for, right? Like our books, Cold as Hell has been out for a little over a month and is probably already one of the most successful weird Westerns ever because there's like five that anyone yeah. can find on Amazon at any time. So I think the tropes were more like classic Western movies that uh, even a, a lot of stuff out of Red Redemption. I mean, that those games hit all the tropes too, because there's yeah. stuff that a Western needs to have. Um, but we wanted those things to also involve magic and, and, and be a, a little bit different, but be something that Western lovers could appreciate too. Yeah. Well, I always well, say that a cliche is a cliche on purpose, right? Like, yeah. Like, well, everyone it, knows the cliches. Yeah, man. Stay and every every like, book yeah. has them. Um, yeah. And like, no reader ever says what the cliche that they thought was a cliche is. It's just right. A word that gets thrown out in reviews a lot for everything. Well, yeah. just to sidle back into how Roger came into this, because I think that's probably what most people who are are joining us today want to know, right? Because Roger, I could listen to Roger. I do listen to Roger. I've, I've listened to my own books 30 times just to hear Roger's voice. My son makes us listen to Dead Acre and Cold as Hell every single night before bed. Um, he's eight years old, so judge me later. Uh, but <laughs> It's not appropriate. But, that's know, but, but I wrote it. So if I wrote it, my rule is if I wrote it, my son can listen to it. If I don't want my son to listen to it, then I better write things that I want him to listen to. Um, yeah. But, you know, as we finished Dead Acre, we were having the discussion. Rhett and I are really, really big audio guys. We're bigger in audio than we are on ebook. And I think that's because we write for audio. We know what audio listeners want because I listen to audio incessantly. Yeah. And so um, when we finished it, we actually didn't know Roger was going to narrate Dead Acre. Um, we actually did not know that Roger did voice acting. We just knew him from Red Dead Redemption. And we had, I mean, I am, I know Red is too. We are giant Red Dead Redemption fans. I mm -hmm. waited for Red Dead 2 for 12 years, like everyone else, or however long it was. And then oh, I didn't. It was that long. <laughs> it, I think it was that long. Um, I think it was 12 years, uh, 2008 to 2020 or something like that. Um, and then we had undead in between, but that didn't satisfy. Um, as a matter of fact, like that's people always say, this is as if Arthur Morgan came back to life. Spoiler. Um, so <laughs> as, as we were talking afterwards, we're like, okay, who should narrate this? And of course my first thought was how about James Marsters? Cause he's Dresden, right? And <laughs> he hasn't done anything other than that. So 
I said, I was on the phone. I said to Rhett, um, I wish Arthur Morgan narrated books. And I hear keyboard clacking in the background. It's like, <laughs> he does. We've brought his work. He's done audio. So we texted or messaged um, Steve Feldberg at Audio Original. Said, can we get Roger Clark? And he came back and he says, perfect. Let's do it. And I think maybe wow. six hours later, we had confirmation that, that Roger would do it. So when we wrote Cold as Hell, we knew Roger Clark. As a matter of fact, the, the, the both of us, when we did our read through of the book, we read it in Roger's voice. <laughs> well, uh, an, an impression of, <laughs> of how it sounds. It has I'll, to I'll fit, say I got damn close, but I'll leave that for you. Know, because it has to fit like that Western style of talking. He's got it. So yeah. Roger, you have certainly, the you certainly hit, you hit it on the nail on the head. It's excellent. I, it just jumped out at me and. It's right. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of books that are perfect for audio, and there's a lot of great books out there that not don't necessarily work well in audio. You know, and, but the way that you fellas write dialogue and the way that the character it just really does jump off from the page, and and it was a joy to work on, an absolute joy to work on. Yeah. Thank you. So Thanks. so let me ask this: You said you write specifically for audio, and and uh, and and I know, you know, what the Athon business model is a lot of times is you know uh, audible first or audible originals and and ebook is a is a uh, uh it works in conjunction with that but you're focused on on audio primarily um what what does it mean to write for audio what what when you are writing what things are going through your mind that say this will this will work better spoken aloud rather than the the you know person creating the character in their head what 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 does it mean to write for audio well Rhett and i specifically write to audio we don't encourage our our, our authors in in athon to do that but Rhett and i have established an audio career you know we started with luke daniels we knew luke daniels was going to read the very goddess saga so we knew how he was going to perform it ray porter etc we knew yeah. the narrators and how they were going to do it roger probably was the easiest because roger has such a um distinct way of delivering lines writing for audio for me meant that um as a matter of fact you can look at our ratings on ebook versus our ratings on audio and you can tell that ebook fans don't get everything that the audio readers get like when when it's a i different experience it's a different experience when i write and when I'm, I'm just talking for me but i think Rhett agrees with this and i'll shut up because i could talk forever um when i write a line a dialogue line i know that roger's going to get the context because he's an intelligent person who understands the context of a line so i don't need to have prose after that line to explain how that line was spoken Right. So when you read it in audio, sometimes, you know, you'll or when you read it in ebook, sometimes the line will be a line that's said with surprise or with vehemence or with this or with that. And a typical ebook would say he said such and such vehemently or he said such and such pointing a finger. But like Roger's going to put that into the performance. Right. So you step back from prose a little bit and you let the dialogue do the talking. And well, you know, I never realized you trusted me that much. Oh, it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that, honestly, that's why it helps so much to know how someone sounds, right? Because there are also narrators who, like you perform, there are some narrators who are great that just read like a Jefferson May, May is, what was the name? It did my, Jefferson the, the circuit. Like, yeah. When great we know who we're writing for, that's what, what really helps. Like if we're writing a book specifically for R.C. Bray or something, uh, when you don't, that it's kind of hard because you don't know if you're going to get a narrator who's super into voices and performance or someone who just does an amazing read through. Um, right. But I, I also think that me and C, our natural writing style is and proven by the reviews and everything is always more of a fit for audio. Um, we're just very character focused, which I think helps audio, right? Cause you're only, you're hearing the character and that's, that's something for me that makes it more written for audio, especially like first person. It's like yeah. someone telling you a story. So, right. And so dialogue, the right? way you guys write is so economical too, because it's just packed with quality and, 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 and content and the dialogue, it just really jumps off at the page at you. The characterizations are established so quickly. Uh, that's what impressed me particularly. 
is how quickly you can just understand who these people are. And uh, in what we've said, like it's a very established genre, the Western, but you also have man you put a little spin on it that is so interesting and engaging and something like we said, he's never seen before. Yeah, it's, it's a real joy. It was a real joy to work on. Roger, what, what is uh, your process like when you, when you sign on to a new project, maybe with, with people that you don't know, with, with authors that you don't know? Um, what is your process like from receiving that manuscript to, uh, you know, getting familiar with the story, identifying the characters? Like, can, can you just kind of walk us through how you um, kind of make out a game plan for how you're going to narrate this book? Sure. So I usually read it once or twice before I record. And okay. <clears throat> The first time I'm really looking for words that I just don't know the pronunciation of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then I'm, and then at the same time, then I'll be looking at characters and in my head, I'll be coming up with, I'll, I'll be taking a note of what defines these specific characters and, and trying to come up with a voice that would suit that. Um, and then I, I, I often, I, I'm very grateful when I can speak to the authors about it because nobody knows the content better than them and, well, uh, is that is that ever an issue are there authors that that don't want to speak to you that that i i've listened to audiobooks before and uh where they mispronounce names and things and and things that it would take a simple google search to to understand or yeah. a conversation with the author they would have cleared that right up uh and, Most and of the time, it's, it's they're always available, you know, but sometimes just through time constraints or what have you, sometimes yeah. they're not alive. Uh, and then you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a bit more, but the, the producer then would speak with you in that, in those gotcha. instances. But the author is almost always available, you know, because they understand, especially these days, uh, how much of a cornerstone the audiobooks is in the entire right. industry. So, yeah. It, authors, it, make yourselves available to your <laughs> audiobook narrators, please. You know, and it's, that's usually, that's ne very rarely been a case for me. Um, uh, and it's always great because you get a, you, you can't get a better understanding of the content uh, than with speaking with the author. Uh, I often find, you know, and I sh probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, sometimes the author is the best narrator because they know exactly, they are, they are so intimate with their own work, they know exactly how it should be delivered. Some authors not so much, but I find a lot of authors are excellent narrators because they're so familiar with their work. But uh, I've always, I've always really, really appreciated uh, the communication that I've had with authors. And, you know, when you're working on something and, that's, you know, to know that, that Stephen read and Jamie beg your pardon were always a, a quick, a quick email away, and they always had they were always able to answer my questions. And but uh, the story, like we were saying, just that unique spin on what is the oldest genre in cinema, at least, and how everyone has has an, a deep understanding of what the western is. And then to have something that gives it a little bit of a spin on it is was just such a joy to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I got a funny, funny story. Another way about how audiobooks has changed the industry, and this might be going a little bit off topic, but romance novels. You know, before audiobooks, romance novels were always written from the female perspective. Right. And then audiobooks came about. And publishers started to soon realize women like to hear a man's voice. So <laughs> it changed the way romance novels are written. Uh, and what you have now is you'll have very often will have the male protagonist so that they can get a male narrator. Or you'll do a chapter each where you know, one chapter is the man and the other chapter is the woman and they'll have multicasts. Uh, audiobooks have revitalized so many aspects of of the of the publishing and book industry it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it that I, I never thought of that that the way that audiobook then affects the way new books are coming out um that that's something to to chew on uh for sure um it, is it ever um jarring to you roger um to be so associated with a character and and then um by extension, a genre, uh, as you have been with Arthur Morgan and, and the way that you are inhabiting so many people's minds with, with, with your unique voice. 
No, no. I mean, I, I, I've always tried to resist pigeonholes. You know, I find that, you know, the, the more you keep your options open, that the, the more diverse you can be, the more work becomes, the more diverse work becomes available to you. But I love Arthur and I, I love the fact that, uh, I've been able to reach out to so many people and such a large audience with one. I mean, that's what an artist's dream is, is to yeah. have your work enjoyed by as many people as possible. And, you know, Cold as Hell and, and Dead Acre is very much, I, I very much inhabit the same cadences and voice as, as Arthur Morgan. But a lot of my other work in audio books, I do, I, I do a lot of Irish stuff. I do, I do British stuff. Um, I really enjoy I enjoy Arthur, but I also enjoy doing other things very much as well. And I'm always going to be grateful for for what Red Dead has done for me. <laughs> well, okay, let me. Uh, so we have a character in Cold as Hell named Irish, and she is a uh, she's a bodyguard of sorts for a historical figure that I will leave spoilers out on. Okay, we won't uh, spoil it. Yeah, but but Irish exists solely because I knew uh, that Roger could do an Irish accent well. And <laughs> so I texted Rhett one day. I'm like, hey, we need to have a character that's Irish. And But then we accidentally made two Irish people. Yeah. <laughs> we made two <laughs> Irishes, remember? And then we, cha we changed one of them to be something else. Who was the first? Uh, Josh Hayes. Oh, pickle finger! Pickle finger was originally an Irish. Yeah, yeah oh, and, really? oh, and, I didn't know that. And then I we were both we were like, "Wait, to the person that we don't want to spoil." Okay, right, right, right. We were both like, "Wait, like he hasn't, he doesn't meet that many people in this book, and we're gonna have two of them in the Wild West be Irish." <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we I mean, there were a lot of Irish, Irish folks. I know yeah. it just. But you're right. No, I'm. You're, yeah, I forgot <laughs> it, it was just funny. That's yeah. hilarious. So, Jamie, you you come up with the concept. And you write the 10,000 nonsensical words as you, your words, not mine, yep. um, where you're just feeling out the character, uh, feeling out the setting, just kind of letting the words uh, inform how you're thinking about the story. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would say um, for sake of, you know, Rhett. I want everyone to realize that Rhett had everything to do with James Crowley as well, because James Crowley was a different character before I sort of brought him to Rhett. Um, well, that was he, that's where I was going. Yeah, with for sure. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you continue then. No, I was I was just going to say that um, how like Rhett, w when do you come in to the story and and you know did you have a clear vision for what Jamie was was working on and 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 where he was. Uh, you know, trying to establish this character. What, where, what is your role at that point? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been working together for so long. I knew yeah. how he works, which sometimes he just needs to write an idea, get it out of his head and, and move on. And he shows yeah. me all of them. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, like, what are we going to do with this? Um, but this one, like the first page, you could just feel the voice. I was right. like, this, I mean, this sounds great. We just would need to figure out where it goes. Um, and again, yeah. like he said, at, at the start, it was very, very biblical. Like he was an angel and everything. Um, and we sort of paired that all back to make him less powerful. We wanted to uh, someone who doesn't have all the answers and all the powers and everything. We really wanted it to be a more human story, even though he's undead. Um, but that was sort of what I did. And I came in as we took basically like out of the 10,000 words, I just needed to hear the voice in the first page, um, which the first page or so was basically telling the story of how he died. Um, yeah. and that was great. And that's what we kept and reworked that into everything else. Basically that first scene in dead acre is only a page or so, right? See if what, maybe a maybe. couple pages, but that's the only thing I think we really kept, which of course was hard to see 8,500 words or nine, you know, seven, whatever it was just thrown away. I mean, he, I think we, I think he met Phelps. I think there was that intro where they're in the saloon, but like it all, it all changed. It just, it all changed. Yeah. I mean, this is our style is those 10,000 words. I work through them and I try to turn them into something and then we we have like an outline of where we want it to go, and we realize it's not working. We both get frustrated, and we're like, let, let's just 
<laughs> Let's just actually start from the beginning instead of trying to massage something that doesn't work anymore. How um, how long have you guys been working together? Um, like four years, five years, five years, I think. Five years. Wow. Yeah. So wow. we we had done one standalone book and a six book epic fantasy series together. Um, which again, this this happened even in the epic fantasy series, like Steve might invent a new character and then we have to like so it's something we've done a lot of just taking a character and ex and building their role and background and stuff so that's where i felt with this so this was the first time we did first person which uh -huh. again it's actually harder i think or it takes longer for two people to write first person than it would for someone to write it alone because we basically <laughs> have to both adopt the same voice and I would imagine that you both need to have an intimate agreement as to who this person is to be able to, to mutually know and write about f for the same person in the first. I, I didn't really, I never appreciated that. Yeah, it takes a lot. I, mean, I would imagine it would take a huge amount of teamwork and, and understanding to, to both agree who, who James Crowley actually is. Yeah, it takes a lot of writing and rewriting or, or revising compared to Buried Goddess Saga, which was third person, we each sort of took a lead on a specific char specific characters. Um, so, like, you could tell, I think it makes it great because every voice for every character is actually different. You right. know, it's not just an author trying to give characters different voices because it's different authors. They, they really do have them. But, yeah, for this, it was about bringing everything together. So it does take longer, I, it, I think, than... If just one of us wrote it along alone but it makes for like a really surprising story because we both are kind of throwing ideas into it as it goes well i think we're both trying to impress each other <laughs> I think that's part of it too, never discount that you have an immediate audience right like i'll write a chapter and i will know that rhett's gonna read this and so my goal is to insert things that make him go that was good wow yeah <laughs> yeah and if it's a comedy like we're, we're working on a, like a fancy comedy book and there was the one line about, about the, the bone that just made me crack up and so when we're doing that like there was a funny character in the fantasy series um it helps with jokes too like if they're landing if a twist surprises like we like i or him might have killed off somebody in the fantasy series where there were so many characters and then it, it just happens, right? The other person doesn't expect it until they see those words. Um, so it does make for fun back and forth. When, um, Rhett, uh, you are more of an outliner, uh, if if I remember your writing process. You Not know, really. More than, me, <laughs> more than Steve. Yeah. Well, I was, <laughs> Steve, is, Steve and I have had a number of conversations about his onion method of, of writing. And you write something and then you go back and add more layer and depth and then go back and add more layer and depth. How does that work when you're co-writing? Um, what is your, your process for establishing, uh, you know, each writer's territory, if you will, and, or it, is everything shared? And, and I know in Buried Goddess, you, where you could take different viewpoint characters, that that is a, a clear delineation of who's is who's. Um, but what do you do when when you've got a first person character and this is one unified story? What what does that feel like to to co author? Chaos. <laughs> I, I, honestly, like I, our method for each chapter might be different as we go, uh, just because first, like again, most co authorships, especially in first person, is probably one person writes a really really rough draft. Then the other person goes through it based off of an outline and it's like sort of a full back and forth but we do it like chapter by chapter together um so in first person it really like i don't think there's a method that we could teach anyone for these <laughs> books it's very very weird i wrote um, about four thousand words of this scene where uh where roger gets to encounter this succubus at a brothel and it's packed full of uh, I think I think what I take most joy in in this series is the one-liners that I know Roger's going to get to say uh, or, or have to say. They're pretty uh, good. 
<laughs> and so I've got this 4,000 words that's just jam-packed with like Western fantasy. Yes, amazing, right? And then I show up and he's like, cool, that's not that's not going in the book. <laughs> well, no, we're going to – we, we – are going to use it, but in a different area, like yeah. we're going to give it a, a reason in the story, but that's what always Steve will write all these one-liners and we both have like notepads of one-liners and then somehow we'll work them into the, into the book. That's why like, we don't throw anything out. Um, but yeah, it definitely, it is a longer, harder process with first person. It's not something that most people probably do because it just, it takes constant back and forth and messaging and, and calls and stuff because you can't really go off the rails. It's just one, one guy compared to third person, which is what I would imagine most like equal parts co-authorships are doing. Um, but again, it's, it's rare that two people are actually writing each thing together. Most co-authorships are going to have someone taking a lead on, on rough draft or based off of an outline and, and kind of a back and forth in that sense. Brett and I wrote a short book together. I don't even know if it's available anymore. It was called um, Two Authors, One Book, Co-Writing Murder Free. And I have the audio book. The, the whole like point of that book was we, I mean, we have a lot of co-authors in with Athon and uh, generally those relationships don't end well. Um, mm. I don't, you know, somehow Rhett and I have made it through. I think, I think a lot of that is that I respect the fact that Rhett knows how to sto- tell a story way better than me. So when he tells me something story-wise doesn't work, I generally don't argue. Um, you know, he's he's always the one that Dead Acre became the story was the story because of Red. Cold as hell. Red didn't necessarily outline it strongly, but he outlined it enough for me to know what I'm supposed to be writing. Otherwise, Roger would have been just running all over fake decks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we never uh, even outlined. Like, I do maybe a page of notes in a Gmail draft or something. We're not huge outliners i'm not when i write on my own either even the buried goddess saga which seems really really well planned out is mostly just us remembering stuff from talking on calls like (laughs) we're not (laughs) big outliners we just sort of know the ending we want to get to yeah Uh, rhett you are the books that you author uh by yourself just as rhett c bruno uh tend to be kind of adventure based sci-fi um you know a more uh, more futuristic sci-fi. What what is it like when when Jamie comes to you with this weird fantasy, um, you know, ideas? What what is it like for a sci-fi writer to to you know go to a different world and and to start thinking, you know, to completely switch gears to to the kinds of stories that that you by yourself would come up with? Well, at the time, I hadn't written sci-fi in a while because we. I mean, we wrote six fantasy book, epic fantasy books in a yeah. row that were really long, like up to 200,000 word books. Um, and then I wrote The Roach, which isn't even science fiction or fantasy at all. Um, so it wasn't really hard because first person to me, like you're writing the character. It doesn't really matter where they are. Um, you know, they, we could have written the same story with him in sci-fi. It would have been like Star Wars basically, but then there wouldn't, be that actual real authentic Western and accent feel and all that. Uh, So my main thing was like, who are we writing this for? Because like publishers gave up on Blackstone is the one who signed this and we submitted cold as hell out everywhere based off of the success of, of dead acre. And Blackstone's the only one that offered besides audio only places, but everyone was like, we love it. We don't know how to market this. Mm. by and and that has become the issue with weird westerners people just won't do it so we were down to either doing it ourselves or working with blackstone and they made an amazing pitch and offer and have been great to work with so it would have been you know and with them since we had more of a personal connection with them like we were able to help out a lot and use a lot of the things we know from athon as well but yeah even for our fr- make me no grave by Haley stone which was actually Athon's first book that we ever published. Um, no, well, the same thing happened to her. Every publisher was like, we love this, but it's weird Western, so we can't do it. Yeah. Um, because they're all, ba- I mean, it's PL statements and they need to look at 
comps and see what they did. And outside of a few, outside of Joe Lansdale and like maybe and Jonathan Mayberry, there no one's really making a lot of money in in this space. So yeah, that was the main question. Was like, who's this for? Let's write something short so that we don't get hooked into something where we're just writing for no reason. Yeah. Um, Roger, I, I know that uh, the internet has changed uh, the publishing landscape for sure, uh, especially with the advent of the Kindle. And I think with uh, with everyone having smartphones uh, now, I think that's probably the biggest factor in the the growth of the audiobook industry because we've got these devices with with tons of storage and we can download it. And, you know, we have earbuds that people walk around with and audiobooks are just extremely accessible. Um, that's I would think yeah, accessible. It's yeah. That, uh, people commuting. It's, it's right. Yeah. But I'll let you finish. No, I, I was, I was thinking um, that for, for a person uh, like you, who is a, is an actor uh, and then, you know, sometimes audiobook narrator, um, does the connectivity of the internet, has that opened up uh, the things that you're able to do? Like, um, uh, do, do you have a home studio where you can record from and then, you know, send audio files to Audible? And like, how has that opened up possibilities for you? I started working uh, for Audible over a decade ago. Uh and I remember hopping on the train to Newark and heading over to their <laughs> office there. And uh, I would work with amazing engineers. But as I got a little bit more experienced, it did eventually evolve to my home studio, which was just in time for COVID. Right. Uh, I was very grateful for that because, you know, I certainly wouldn't have, without that home studio, I certainly wouldn't have been carrying on working. But but yeah, I, I, I've been very, very fortunate in that... Uh, you know, I've done a lot of stuff for Tantor, Audible, and now Blackstone, and you know, Penguin as well. And I, I love narrating audiobooks. It's really is one of a, a passion of mine, and I love the fact that so many wonderful authors trust me with their work to do it. I wanted to ask you guys something. I was going back to the uh, the supernatural aspect of the Western and the way that you so geniusly put a little spin on it. But I've noticed that like a lot of the flashbacks, for example, in the Black Badge series. They don't have the supernatural aspects before James is uh, embraced in the afterlife. I noticed that. Uh, did you guys specifically change the style, uh, or, or just sim or, or mildly tweak it somehow? When you write about his his flashbacks, it's it reads very much like uh, like the tr more traditional Western novel than than when James is, you know, uh, obviously dealing with with his angels and. And the afterlife and i was wondering if there was any intentional way did you change the mildly tweak the style at all to suit that well i think just naturally you have to take out all of james's knowledge of what is to come and so you're you're pulling a, a giant sort of portion of this per, this person's you know because we've talked before on the phone like this is a person to us james is a is a human being that uh, he's not just a character in a book. He just he comes alive for you. Uh, we took all that, like threw it away. Like he doesn't know that Shar exists. He doesn't know, he doesn't Very believe different. that heaven and hell exist, right? He's just an outlaw. The beauty with James was that, of course, he's the, he's the outlaw with a heart of gold. And although he's caught in the positions that he's in, uh, he often finds himself not okay with how Ace is handling them. Um, but he's, he's sort of becoming a hero, even in his flashbacks, um, you know, your performance, and I, I hesitate to say uh, Red Dead Redemption because the reality is it, it honestly is your performance in Red Dead 2 because to me, Red Dead 2 not just graphically exceeds the first one. It exceeds the first one in, in every possible way. Yeah. Um, and so much of that is you. Um, even things like the train robbery, you know, one of the best, one of my favorite things to do in Red Dead Redemption 2 is just ride up alongside a train with a horse, hop off and go to town. And so, you know, when Rhett and I were talking about tropes, right, he's like, well, we have to have a train robbery, right? And we actually <laughs> fought tooth and nail, uh, Rhett, if you remember, to figure out where this train robbery goes. 
We wanted it to be the opening. We wanted it to be the close. And neither of those two things work. And I think Rhett was the one that came up with the idea with the Vanderbilts, right? That was you. I, yeah, I, we just that entire thing. We just I, we were like, let's do another Ace flashback when you know, like because it'll it'll fit that moment. And again, I think a lot of the difference in style comes down to an editing thing, which is readers tend to complain about flashbacks. I don't know why, right? Like on TV shows, they're the bit like no one cares and they're they're huge. Everyone uses them in books. It's just an old editing thing, like no flashbacks, or if you have them, really short. So that's why the flashbacks are him doing stuff, dialogue, no expansion beyond that. Like they have, like we keep them really simple um, to keep the word count low. So they move fast. So the momentum of the story do doesn't go away. And the flashback has a specific thematic purpose. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's probably the change in style. He, you know, you lose that waxing poetic Western thoughts and it's more quickly telling what, a story of what happened in his mind. So that probably an incidental reason for the change, but the lack of magic is, you, you know, we want to make sure people realize like normal people aren't part of this world, right? Even if the monsters they might meet in the wild, they kill them. That's why they become legends um, or they come back and talk about them and they sound crazy, right? Like, so normal people aren't involved in this side of the world that he's seeing. So in his flashbacks, he can't know or, or, or see any of that stuff either. Red, I want to ask you something. When you talked about uh, flashbacks and how editors would be no flashbacks, um, are there rules rules uh, in uh, in writing that that need to be broken sometimes, or maybe there's 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 just an opportune time for them to be broken, or uh, you know, it's kind of like Stephen King's book on writing. He says never use adverbs, and then you know, then you've got Neil Gaiman, who, you know, just feels like he's just, you know, scattering seed with adverbs sometimes, you know, um, like, are there hard and fast rules? Um, and, and if those are hard and fast rules, how do you know when is the proper time to use them or to break those rules? Um, I mean, I think there's hard and fast rules as far as like, it should look like a book, right? Well, yeah, well, we get submissions yeah. sometimes that like, don't write a paragraph that's an entire page long because right. that just hurts your eyes and yeah. like dialogue needs to work correctly and stuff. But beyond that, I think people get a little too hung up on it. And that's likely because the industry used to be controlled by it. Honestly, like it was a few editors, right? Even now yeah. every publisher has like 30 imprints. There's so many editors who have different opinions on right. how things need to be. And what we've started to realize with Athon is the rules are different for every subgenre and every genre of what's acceptable, right? Like an info dump, every editor is like, don't do an info dump. You're like, well, how well, like people can't be lost in this science fiction book or this fantasy book. So in those genres, info dumps actually wind up being okay. Um, if, if you're writing for audio, things are a little different too. I mean, my most successful book ever is Titanborn, which was with Random House. And I built the story around flashbacks and there, there were like three or four flashbacks in it and originally there was only one and the editor actually uh encouraged me to add two more that would create sort of a, a three-part arc to the flashbacks that's informing the present and i think a lot of that is again my i watch tv and movies more than i read and i write in a style that is very tv and movie yeah, where flashbacks are acceptable. Um, and I think where flashbacks got a bad rap was sort of just using them as a crutch yeah, to explain a character and not having it really have any relevance to the story or anything, where when I do a flashback, it means Steve do one. Like that flashback is coming at a point where that character would be thinking about that exact moment. And that moment is affecting something that's happening in, in that present. Like it's, it's a purpose. It's not just a way to boost word count or a way to fill in information on, on, on a character. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the rules exist for editors to have a way to structure a book. 
But now yeah. as there's so many different ways to read, there's so many different rules that are different for every format um, that I think you just need to be true to the voice of the book and the tone of the book, not write a serious book. And then all of a sudden halfway through there's like becomes a comedy and then goes back. Right. Yeah. You'll see the, that in movies, like some of the Marvel movies nail the comedy aspect. Yeah. Some it turns it into a joke and a lot of people wind up complaining. Um, so you just have to really be true to the tone of the book and keep it consistent. I think. Well, black badge started with a flashback. It's uh, that's how I died. Right. Like yeah. that's the moment, right. Where we wrote how James Crowley died and it was, it took place 20 years before the actual story. took place. And that flashback. Very, very, it grabs you. Thanks man. I don't think it, I don't think the story works. Um, Cold as hell does not work without flashbacks either because we need to know who James Crowley was and it can't just be James. No, there's a, definite, there's a definite evolution there. I mean, I, that's a huge, huge transformation. And and it, it, de it demonstrates your intimate understanding of who he is because you also intimately understand who he was. Jamie and Rhett, you wrote this book with the benefit of knowing that Roger would voice um, not only this character, but the, the whole story. A lot of times when you're writing a book, you don't have the benefit of knowing who will uh, read this for the audiobook performance. Um, when you're writing, uh, especially someone who has such a, um, a strong dialect and, and a dialect that, um, that gives us so much of the character. And it gives us not only his character, but it informs the place and the time that it comes from. Um, and, and so much of that is woven directly into your, into your prose, into the dialogue of it. Sometimes you don't have the benefit of being able to write a character that, um, that strongly, um, and you have to rely on, uh, dialogue tags and, and things like that. Um, it, what is the difference in writing? Um, I, I guess where I'm trying to get to is, um, what do you do you ever write dialects into the and, and slang uh, into the dialogue so that it reads the way that that a, a performer performer will perform it? Uh, or do you rely on describing the dialogue outside of the dialogue? D does that make any sense? Yeah, at all? Um, I, I write a lot of fantasy and Rhett and I wrote a million word fantasy together. And when we had dwarves, they spoke in in text. They spoke like dwarves. Um, you know, Roger actually did something tremendous with uh, Cold as Hell. And I, I remember texting him. So I got an early copy of it and I'm listening through it. I mean, I listened through that so fast and then listened to it again. Um, he did a character named Cedric uh, that we didn't give him any instruction as to who that character was outside of uh, he's a black man. That's about it, right? Like there's a moment where he is called dark skinned. Um, and Roger read him as a Yankee. Uh, he's a Pinkerton. And I remember, Roger, you remember I texted you. I'm like, that Cedric performance was absolutely phenomenal for me. Oh, thanks. I, yeah, I remember the Pinkertons. You know, were, I, I remembered a lot of the Pinkertons were from the East Coast. And the, they yeah. were, they're kind of in, they were invading, the literally invading the Wild West in more ways than one. It was also metaphorically as well as literally. And I wanted to make his voice very different and from, from all the Western characters. This is a guy from New York, you know, he doesn't belong here, but he's taking, you know, he's, he's the sign of the future, so if you will. Yeah. No, and Hank, to your question, I think it it really helps to know, but especially in first person, right? Like if you're doing yeah. third person, it, it's a little more narrative reliant. I mean, me and Steve are big subtext dialogue writers anyway, where we try to let the words tell how people feel more than needing to explain it. Um, but yeah, I mean, even with my Children of Titans series, when I found out RC Bray was narrating, actually Steve edited the whole thing because he, he had listened to so many RC Bray books <laughs> so we could actually really fit it to his voice. Um, 
And that was just a benefit of having time before he was going to start. And so we like re-edited all, all the books, but yeah, it's tough. Cause a lot of, I mean, me, like me, look, me and Steve are, are really lucky. We run Athon. We have enormous access to narrators and audio publishers. Yeah. Typically when we start writing something, we know who we're good at. Like at this point, if we want this certain narrator and they're not like a celebrity, we can get them or we'll wait until they're ready. Um, so that's going to be a lot different than a lot of these traditional published authors where, you know, they're getting audio a year later or they basically aren't in control of the decision at all. Right. So it's hard to know we're in a lucky position where we always know, or we know with enough lead time to then go back and edit it for that ex exact person. Um, but that's not a benefit most authors are going to have, especially if they're not in the end, like, either producing it themselves or intimately involved in the production itself. And that goes back to Roger saying, sometimes he doesn't get to talk to the author. Sometimes when you're with a big publisher, you don't even know that you could talk to your narrator. Right. You get a sheet, you provide some pronunciations and that's the end of it. They, they, they might not even want the author to talk to the narrator because then the producer doesn't know all the information getting passed back and forth. I mean, even with Athon, we have some policies with that, right? Because if we let every author have direct contact with the narrator, we don't know how often that author is going to suggest changes or suggest, you know, uh, the narrator might get overwhelmed speaking yeah. with, with an author. And we know that from experience because early on, Rhett and I didn't know the process. And uh, I got in trouble once for messaging a narrator. Uh, Audible Studios has a you don't talk to the narrator rule unless we are all CC'd in that email. And I didn't know that I had the dude's email address and I shot him an email one day and it blew up. It became a huge major issue. And so that informed how Athon runs things. Okay, we give you a sheet, you give us this. If the narrator has questions, they ask us, we then ask you. Um, and for us, it was to protect the narrator because we know authors can get overwhelmingly excited about a performance. <laughs> of their book. We're yeah. overwhelmingly picky. About right. every voice, and at a certain point, the narrator needs to do the, how perform it how they want to perform it. Yeah. Um, so we kind of leave it up to the narrator if they say, "Yeah, I'll talk to them or do a call," then then we'll do it. But otherwise, it, it, it that level of connection is rough. Um, and you know, it's it's a different case for us just because you know of running Athon, we have those connections. But for for most authors, there there probably isn't any communication with the narrator whatsoever some of the audio publishers don't even ask for a pronunciation list like if you don't provide it they're going to do it however they want to do it um luke daniel phenomenal narrator right he's mispronounced so many words in the very goddess saga <laughs> um but like they're not really mispronounced they're just the way that he would have pronounced them and so yeah. Rhett and i sort of adopted his pronunciations of things going forward yeah, like we didn't know that ZH is supposed to sound like a J sound, right? right. Like, and that happened in, in that or, or in Titanborn. Oh, and in, in, in Barry. And in that, there's a character called Zaff, which is Z H A F F, and that was always his name. And then I didn't even put it in the pronunciation list because I like I didn't want to spell it Z A F F because that looks stupid. The H makes it look cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> RC Bray read, read it Jaff the whole book, and I was like, all right, well, I guess he's. He's Jaff now, who knew? And then we had Zulong in the Bird Goddess Saga, and Luke Daniels read it, Zulong. And so that was when we both learned ZH is that's <laughs> what it becomes, because apparently that's how it's <laughs> phonetically supposed to be pronounced. So there's things that will surprise you in, in that funny. sense. But some authors really can't take that level of change. Yeah. And, and so that's why, you know, and some narrators yeah. want to ask a million questions and some authors don't want to talk to anybody. Right. Yeah. So it, it controlling the communication does become sort of a necessity. So just, just having an established um, uh, process, it just keeps everyone out of trouble all around. Just, hopefully. you know, yeah, hopefully uh, Roger, when, when you are presented with a new project, how do you choose the projects you're going to work on and, and how, how long does it take you to get a feel for whether this is something that that uh, you will enjoy doing, uh, or or something that that you can bring a certain, you know, uh, character to life. Well, 
Um, I, I, I love all challenges and, uh, you know, I do a lot of, I do a lot of nonfiction as well. I've done a lot of history books. I, um, I, I really do like to sink my teeth into, into all, lots and lots and lots of different types of books, but, uh, well, I'll look at the breakdown and, uh, more often sometimes, sometimes the offer will be a straight up offer. Other times it'll be, they'll ask me to read a couple of pages and, Sometimes the pages that I choose are up to me, and sometimes the pages are up to them. And uh, I study that intently uh, before I submit. And I, I think with those, and I purposefully, for the purpose of that, I don't look at the rest of the book. If that's the bite that they want me to deal with, and that's the bite that they get, and I and I usually make my decision from that, because uh, you know if it's not a firm offer, it's it's not very time economical to go through the whole book uh, sure. when you're preparing for it so uh, i usually go for the somewhere in the beginning of the book like in the first or second chapter i'll pick three or four pages that uh that i feel really showcase the main character and um uh, and has and is a good demonstration of the author's style and then i try and put my my label on that and then it's up to them to decide whether they think it's a good match or not Excellent. Cold as Hell Black Badge Series Book One, which is actually the the second edition in this um, in this series, is available now. You can uh, the uh, Dead Acre, the the first novella, I guess it is uh, that was produced, is also available. We'll put links to it where you can find it easily. Um, Jamie, Rhett, Roger, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. Can I just say, Roger, thank you for joining. This is like, I'm fanboying. <laughs> oh, God, it's my pleasure, man. My pleasure. Thanks for, I'm sorry we had to change the time. But thanks for your flexibility. That's okay. It's all good. It's all good.